So now on the staging side, we can see that we have a set of what we call staging pipelines. And staging pipelines, they, this is just the default set. And we can see that I have a bash staging uh, pipeline, but there's only one bash stager in it. But they're really designed for uh, a flow of step one, build code, step two, test code, step three, mm -hmm. do tagging of something. And these stagers can have different policies depending on what team is responsible for them. So in the base case, I'm a developer. I'm just using the platform by myself. I'm an admin. I probably don't care about breaking out those concerns. Right. But when you're looking at a big enterprise, there's usually a testing team that is responsible for all of the testing for the, a particular application. Right. And then there's a dev team and a build tooling team, et cetera. Well, we can decouple those concerns, allow them to upload updates to their staging pipelines and uh, stagers independently. And so say that I have a testing team and I have a build stager and then a test stager. Well, say the test stager breaks. Well, I know exactly who broke it. And the testing team has access to go fix it and no one else can touch it. Ah. So you can actually control and know exactly where your breakages are happening, address them more quickly, and make sure the right people are touching the right bits of your code. With something like a build pack, it becomes a little bit more difficult because it's all consolidated as one unit, which means the teams have to uh, work with each other in order to make any changes, rather than making those logical distinctions and allowing them to work independently. So, Another thing that may be unique to people that are used to the Docker ecosystem is that we actually create packages within the system. So with Docker, you get what we call a golden image. I go to the Docker registry and I say, get me this image. And it has all of the file system layers for that complete image. And at first glance, it's very convenient. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the registries are very convenient, which is um, part of the reason I think Docker got so popular is kind of like it's the new tarball. I have this container image. I launch it, it works everywhere, and I can launch the service. Right. So it was a convenience argument more than a security argument. Now, th things start to break down a little bit when you ask, well, I have a thousand Docker images deployed. Can you tell me which ones are running Java 1.7? Uh, there's no auditability in Docker for figuring out what's actually running in your environment. This makes auditing your systems very, very difficult. And it makes it so that um, you have to add additional tooling around Docker to try to address some of these so that, concerns. So that seems to be the approach that Docker is taking, adding the tooling around Docker. Yes, and <clears throat> to me, um, we do it a little bit different. So when you stage an application, it's going to create a package that is just your application. It doesn't include your OS bits. It doesn't include your runtime bits. It doesn't include any of those things with the package that you just staged. But it has metadata that says, oh, I staged this, and this thing is going to need, say, Ruby. And policy can be asked, what version of Ruby should I give this person? So it'll bring in Ruby, and then it'll look at the Ruby package and say, what does Ruby need? Oh, it looks like Ruby needs a Linux OS to be running on top of. Policy, what Linux OS is preferable? And we dynamically build the file system based on what policy tells us is appropriate for that file system. Mm. And we include all the metadata of every package that you're using. So in our system, you ask what, job, what jobs are running Java 1.7. Well, right now I don't have a lot of jobs running. So let's go ahead and deploy something and see what that looks like. So, and what we're going to do is actually we're going to uh, just do a de demo node app. Now this is just a node app. There was nothing special done to this application to stage it in our platform. So I'm going to create my to-do app. And I'm going to go ahead and start my to-do app. It's going to ask me where it is, defaults to my current directory. How many instances of to-do do I want? Let's go ahead and launch two. How much RAM should it use? Quick summary of what it uh, will deploy with. And let's go ahead and deploy it. Well, notice that it created the package and then uploaded it to our stagers. And it noticed that it was Node.js. It picked up our Node.js stager. It went ahead and installed all the modules that were necessary for the application to run. And then it gave me a URL where I could go and take a look at this application. So if I take a look at this, we can see indeed this is running, but there's no database. As I didn't tell it, it could connect to one. And so let's go back to the terminal screen. And if we take a quick look at my to-do application, we'll see that the packages are called out. So 
it uses the to-do package. And it noticed to-do needed node 442. And node needs git and Python to function. And all of those need a uh, operating system to be used. But it is very obvious what software this particular package is using. It knows exactly what the dependencies are, and it knows exactly how to articulate those to your system administrator for easier audits. Now let's go ahead and attach this to a database. So I'm going to bind a service, and we called it to-do Postgres, I believe, and we're going to bind it to our to-do app. And this just says, you know, take this database and make sure that it is uh, possible to connect to this app. So it needed to restart to tell the app what the different uh, settings were. It outputted some environmental variables for connecting to your database. And now when we go ahead and we refresh this, we can see that the error is gone for Postgres, and we can see that it is actually functional. Now, MySQL's still not there, that's still throwing errors, but everything worked as expected, and this is using our semantic pipeline. It automatically put the semantic mm -hmm. pipeline between the job, and in fact, if we go back to our apps, we can see that I have a to-do app. But if we look at kind of the networking pieces, we can see that you know it is bound to this particular service that is also bound to this Postgres app that is powering that service. We can see the relationships. We can see the number of requests per second. We can see what routes are available. So this is just the data that you're automatically capturing. Right? Absolutely. We mm -hmm. capture a lot of automated data. And the reason that that's important... So this helps them, this does provide that auditing of the container, so to speak. Absolutely. And it shows, it shows that our containers are actually containing and creating boundaries around what you're deploying mm -hmm. and controlling all of that, that network access while still being convenient and easy to use. Mm -hmm. Now, the packages, so say that I want to go and take a look at what's using a particular package. We saw that the job had a reference, right? Well, let's go take a look at the node package. So let's just type in node. There is the node 442 package. And look, jobs using this package. And I see that there's my to-do app. So if I have 5,000 jobs in production, and I want to know what jobs are using a particular package, I click on the package, and I have a list of all the jobs that use it, and an easy way to update those packages for those jobs moving forward. This is a level of flexibility and power that most other systems on the market do not have. Now, in addition to that, we have all of our route management. So we can see that you know the console where I'm at right now, that route's there. Continuum guide and docs are both going to my continuum guide job. And then the to-do app generated a route for me uh, for to-do. But what's nice is that these routes also have policy applied. So I can guarantee that www.yourdomainname.com is actually always pointing to the correct app. I can guarantee that the routes that are key for your infrastructure are enforced and managed and secured mm -hmm. with the rest of your platform to avoid mm -hmm. the situation where, oh, I deploy this Docker container, right? And I got an IP back for this Docker container. Mm -hmm. Now I have to go into my DNS management service and update an yeah. IP there. What if I accidentally delete something? Yeah. What happens to my audit trail as to who did what actions on these jobs? Right. All of a sudden, a bunch of pieces break down as soon as you have to go into a right. new uh, product to it's manage not, a piece of It's not turtles all the way down. It's checkboxes all the way down. Exactly. Checkboxes that are done by humans that could yeah. make mistakes. Yeah, exactly. So the more you can automate that away, the better. Mm -hmm. Now, this is one of the newer features that we did. Uh, so these are layer two virtual networks. So by default, uh, most of our stuff was done with NAT. Now, you have a container with a zero conf address, map to NAT, and it allows for mm -hmm. the ingress and egress to that job. But we found that there's a lot of workloads that need layer two networking support. And we built this out with OVS, and it allows me to create virtual networks inside of my environment. So let's say that I want to create a network called lab, and I'm just going to go ahead and create my lab network. We can see that I have a lab network. It was given a subnet, and then I can bind jobs to that network. And they will be on one logical subnet, be able to talk to each other, and they have full layer two connectivity across any of the hosts. And this also works within our hybrid environment. So this is a binding in a different context. Exactly. So you can bind to a service or I could bind <clears throat> to the network. So because you're treating everything as a node. Exactly. So mm -hmm. I have all these jobs and I can treat them as just little objects. This object belongs on this network. 
and therefore, uh, you know, it gets all of that ingress or egress. Otherwise, you'd be manually putting this together. Absolutely. Mm. So you can have as many of these networks as you want. These are isolated, and uh, the jobs that are on the network can communicate with each other. And you can also do service discovery through these networks. So you can attach a name that is resolvable by DNS on those network nodes. So say that I wanted to put to-do in the lab network. I could have it so that service discovery says, yeah, when you look for the host to-do, this is how it resolves. And that way, if the job leaves and rejoins the network and gets a slightly different IP for any reason, you still have a static uh, DNS entry or service discovery address that you can always find those jobs and connect them together. Now, that's a lot of features that uh, I just covered, a lot of different pieces that need a single way to unify the security and policy around them. And we are a policy and security first company. So this is a kind of an example of some of the policies. And let's start with some very basic ones. Let's take a look at how we do package resolution. So this is an example of our package resolution policy. This is how it knew what version of Node to use for my to-do app. This is how it knew what version of an operating system to automatically pull in for my job. And it basically says map Linux to this particular image mm -hmm. or map Ruby to this particular version mm -hmm. of Ruby. Right. And it, as you can see at the top on job colon colon slash, this applies to all the namespaces or the entire cluster. But this could very much be on job colon all colon the namespaces production. Mm -hmm. And you could say in production, I need this operating system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in dev, I need this operating mm -hmm. system. And in staging, I need this version of Ruby. And for this developer, I need this version of Ruby. So this is a routing mechanism in itself. And yeah, it basically adjusts the <clears throat> way that we pull in our software dynamically so that you can fine tune it for your environment, provide all that flexibility that developers need, and really do it as a first class system. Now, we also have, you know, Docker-based policies that I might as well show. So, sorry, there's some lag on that screen. So by default, we let, if you're an admin, I'm going to let you deploy Docker. Uh, and admins in the system can deploy whatever they want and do whatever they want. However, for people that are not admins, uh, and you could turn that off, obviously. This is, uh, you know, included right now. But I could lock it to a particular registry. I could lock it to particular images. I can do a lot of granular controls over what Docker repositories I'm allowed to connect to and change that based on what I'm deploying to in AppSera. So in production, maybe there's a production registry you want to use. We can lock it to that production registry and guarantee that nothing else ever gets deployed from Docker other than from that registry. Uh, maybe for your developers, you want to allow them any Docker environment. You can do that as well. And they're all isolated and contained using our container runtime. Mm -hmm. So you know that that's safe to give them the freedom to play around in their sandbox and do the pieces that they need to do to do their job. Now, we also have policies for things like permissions, just to give you an idea of how granular it is. So audit trails only allow read. Obviously, you shouldn't be able to update or create fake audits. <laughs> so there's only read access. But on a job, I can control whether I can create it, read it, update it, delete it, start it, stop it, map routes to it, do SSH to it, whether I should be able to link it to another job, whether I should be able to promote it to another job type, whether I can do join it to a network. All these granular permissions are, uh, are allowed. And you can create these pseudo groups. So, you know, if permit all. Well, you could have another group like if permit dev. And you can give them a dev set. And you can do all of these different things for every resource in our system, whether that's a service, a service gateway, a provider, a route, a job, a package, all of these things are very, very granular within our policies. And then inside of you know basic auth settings, here's some basic users I let into my cluster. Basically says, yep, let Josh at appsera.com log in through Google. Let Kamisama log in through Google, or let my minimal personal account uh, log in through Google. So it's very easy to add additional OAuth 2 users, uh, which is uh, in Community Edition, we allow for OAuth 2 and basic auth over HTTPS. Um, we do actually limit enterprise options to just the enterprise edition. So if you want Kerberos or LDAP or crowd integration or some of the enterprise specific right. authentication, then you will need to use our enterprise edition. 
And then we also have our full audit trail just to kind of round out the different services available on the web console. Uh -huh. And as you can see, I know when a network was created, when bindings were added, when jobs were started, when jobs were stopped. I can see who did it, even if it was a system action. So I know that the staging coordinator did some things for me. Great. I did some things. The package manager needed to download some things. But we can see exactly what it downloaded. And even what the system is doing is audited. So you know whether or not some action has happened. And we can add all the policies for any of these different pieces and filter them down and actually look at, you know, stagehand. That's something that we use. So to does this, the granularity, does it allow then the gra granularity? Down to the container itself. Doesn't allow Absolutely. Yeah. You get all the logs, yeah. you get all the actions, you get all of the <clears throat> network security perimeter, you get all of these things in one cohesive product. Does that data get fed anywhere then? You can. Uh, so right now the audit trail is logged internally, and then the logs can be exported via syslog. Uh, you, there is no external uh, export for the audit trail right now, uh, but that is actually on our roadmap to provide a better way to get consume this data. Because then they can start to see patterns. Exactly. And we, there is filters. So if you want to filter for a particular user or a particular job, all of that is completely possible today. So we can do something like, OK, so we have a local name of to do. So I care about to do in the local name. So and we can see everything that happened yeah. to the to do app over the course of its lifetime. So what are people how are people using this now? You know, you've just taken us through pretty much, you know, you know, the web console. Yes. Um, how are people using, using this? And you know, what are you, what are some of the patterns you're starting to see in those use cases? So what we're seeing is there's the big data workloads with spark. We have, you know, normal PaaS type workloads, you know, web applications that connect to a database and a memory store. We've seen use cases where uh, people want to play around with the, well, in CE, not the hybrid cases, but the hybrid cases are very popular with our enterprise customers. But they want a PaaS that works, is as simple as the PaaS as they're used to, but actually provides the security and policy features that if they grow, um, they're not going to outgrow the platform that they're on. And that's really important for us. You know, Derek, for a little bit of history, was the architect of Cloud Foundry. And it doesn't have this granular sense of permissions and right. controls and isolation. Right. And we have converted some customers that were using products from the Cloud Foundry ecosystem over to our platform, mainly for the additional policy and security controls, the enhanced service gateways that we provide, the ephemeral credentials we provide with our semantic pipelines. All of those different pieces are uh, being looked at as what does it take to have operationally mature platform that works across multiple clouds that is easy to administer and can actually be administered in one place and provides all the hooks you need for your infrastructure. Kind of the Apple versus Android kind of equation there. You can ship a fully working, well-tested, cohesive yeah. product or you can have a lot of great products and figure out how to patch them together. And your mileage might vary. Maybe you put together something that's great. Maybe you put together something that has holes. But it requires a lot of effort, a lot of time, a lot of experience, and a lot of uh, due diligence to make those decisions. We feel like a lot of companies are looking for someone to provide that unified platform that just works. Josh, this has been great. Why don't we take a quick break and then perhaps you can show us the, the command line uh, version of this. I'd be happy to do that. Great, thanks. Uh